Well, hello once again, everybody, and everyone that's watching at home or wherever you're located, or if you're in a Noah's Ark, if you're there, because <laughs> of all the rain. Hey, everybody, can you guys do me a big, big favor? Can we welcome everyone that's watching online? If this is your first time, nice and loud, let's welcome everybody. I just want to encourage everybody, uh, you know, we're, uh, I know today, right now, at the time of this broadcast, there is uh, so, so, uh, supposedly a hurricane outside, but we're doing okay, and, uh, and so we're, we're fine. God promised he would not flood the earth again, so I think we're good, right? But no, all kidding aside, we're so glad that you could be here today. Hey, my name is Eric Bucci, and I'm the lead pastor here, and uh, I just want to thank you so much for, for joining us, and I want to thank you so much for coming today. This is an honor and a privilege it is for me, by the way, just to be able to share the Word of God with you, because, you know, it's, it's really what it's about. It's about God, and my objective is that I would just show you God and, and help you to go to God, not go to me, but just try to help you along the way, and I feel like my job is to be like a, a if you will, a game warden, someone that works in a natu- uh, national park, and just to help you to experience and say, listen, this is the beautiful, this is the Grand Canyon. Go ahead and hike in it, and this is what you'll see, and just to encourage you to experience God. And that's really our job, is to help you experience God for yourself, to grow. Not that we become the end of it, not that we become that you're dependent upon us, but we want to be mutually dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ and help each other to grow in Christ. That's what it's all called, and that's why we're called here. Well, today we're talking about uh, 1 Peter, and actually we're concluding the 1 Peter book today. We've been going through it like for 27 weeks, and uh, I wanted to through it, go through it quicker, but there's so much good stuff in there. And next week, we're going to 2 Peter. So if you thought 1 Peter was good, wait till you see 2 Peter, which actually even turns up more, and it shows us how to deal with difficulty and how to overcome. And I think in our culture right now, as we've been praying, I just believe this, these books of the Bible are really apropos for what we're going through. But today, we're talking about this, overcoming the devil. Oh, come on, really? You, you actually believe in the devil? Give me a break. Is this some pitchfork guy in a, in a jumpsuit, uh, some mythological creature? Come on, let's be real. That's a metaphor. There's no such thing as the devil. You guys blame the devil for everything. I know, how many people know people that blame the devil for everything, right? I mean, what happened? How's your day? Oh, the devil. I mean, I hear more about the devil than I hear about God. Uh, you know, even people complain. I even have deviled eggs. And I mean, it's just everything's a devil. The devil, the devil, the devil. And there are other people out there that completely ignore the devil. Well, what does the Bible say about the devil? And, and, and Peter is finishing off his book here, and he's talking about how we are to persevere and that we are to stand strong in persecution and in difficulty. We are to press forward and how to overcome the enemy. We're going to talk about today. Overcoming the devil. Now... <laughs> Uh, George Barna and the Barna Group, which is a Christian, if you will, Gallup poll, did a survey, and we found out back in 1991, 71% of Americans believe in the God of the Bible. Now today, 49% believe in the God of the Bible, that there is a personal God. But you know what's so interesting is this, 56% Satan is not merely a symbol of evil, but a real spiritual being influences human lives. 56% of Americans now believe that. Now check this out. 49% are not entirely sure that God exists. Now it doesn't make any sense to me. How can you believe more in the devil than God? But this is what the author said. Americans are not, are, are, are not more confident about the existence of Satan than they are of God. So what's this kind of bizarre? Uh, what does that mean? Well, there is a belief in Satanism. There is a belief that there's an evil force. But what does the Bible say about it? And you know, how many of you have ever heard that wonderful Lion King, right? Uh, well, the Bible says the devil is like a roaring lion, seeking who he will devour. And a lot of people are like this. We want we, we near the village, the peaceful village, the lion sleeps tonight. Yeah, I used to be in Broadway for the Lion King. I'm just kidding. (laughs) But many people think that the lion is sleeping tonight. It's no big deal. Hey, it's okay. It's no big deal. Hey, we're doing fine. And we begin to attack each other. And we begin, we don't understand that the battle is beyond what we're seeing with our eyes. So what does the Bible say about the devil? Is there really a devil? And if there is, what do we deal with it? 
Well, let's go right to 1 Peter. What we're going to do right now is we're going to read the rest of the chapter, okay? And then we're going to go back line by line, verse by verse. I don't know if you guys have been enjoying this, but I, I'm really thoroughly enjoying this kind of teaching, expository, going line by line, verse by verse, letting the Bible bring the topics up. Okay, here we go. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvius, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Now, all you single people out there, be careful. You don't just run out to people and kiss them. Okay. <laughs> Greet each other with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. All right, so now we're going to break it down. What's the deal about the devil? Okay, first of all, there is a real devil and there is an invisible war. Let me give you a brief history of civilization. Uh, before the uh, creation of mankind, there was a battle in the heavenlies where Satan decided to rebel against God. You can see some of it in Isaiah where he said, I will make myself like the most high God. I will lift myself up. Pride was the original sin. He rebelled against God. There was a, some, and a third of the angels left and followed him. There was, there was a problem in the heavenlies, if you will. Okay, and so now uh, there is a brief time the enemy has free reign to a certain extent. Not completely free reign, which we'll share about in a few moments, so there was a, a rebellion against God, and so Satan is the chief demon. He's like the president of the demons, if you will. And they have a bunch of other angels, and their job is to stop or try to trip us up. Now, I, I, we're going to show you what it means and what it doesn't mean, okay? I'm not suggesting for a moment a lot of the Hollywood movies are not really accurate. The enemy comes in a much more sinister way than scaring you half to death. That would be counterproductive. The Bible says he comes like an angel of light. He doesn't come as a boogeyman most of the time, okay? Oh, the boogeywoman. We don't want to be sexist, okay? We want to be inclusive this morning. Uh, but there is a real devil and an invisible war going on. In 1 Peter 5, uh, uh, 14 says this, Be sober-minded and be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion. If you've ever watched Animal Planet or watched these things, what happened to Serengeti, you'd see a, a, a lion that has a mane that looks like the grass, and it would sit there, and as you see a pack of zebra going in a pack, there might be one that's kind of drifting away from the pack. The lion sees that. The lion sleeps. No, the lion's not sleeping. The lion looks at that, preys on it, and pounces and gets that zebra. There's safety in the pack. You get out of the pack, you're in trouble. That's why we're encouraging you. In this past 18 months, we've been separated. God wants us. Do not forsake the gathering together. We need to join together. We need each other to keep each other protected. And that we can work together and kick against the enemy. And that's how we do it. But if he can isolate us, as my old pastor, Pastor Joe, used to say, Christians are like bananas. They're, they're safe in a bunch. But if, you, but if you're by yourself, you get peeled and eaten. I thought that was funny. I know Mike Letourneau is here, and he understands that one. Uh, but be sober-minded, be watchful. And, and so what's that all about? Well, the Bible also says in Ephesians 6, it talks about the war that you and I are facing. And this is what the Bible says. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. What you see with your natural eyes is not what, there's, what there is only. In fact, right now, if you had the ability, you would see microwaves, TV signals, radio signals, you name it. There's thousands of signals in right now, cell signals that are going through the air right now, but you can't see them. But if you have the right apparatus, you can discern it. 
Well, my friends, just like you can't see radio waves and satellite beams and microwaves, there is a spiritual realm that is out there right here, right now. It is real. Just because you can't see it does not mean it's not real. All right, so we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers. Now, these are talking about different um, strata of authority, rulers against the authorities, against the cosmic powers, talking about the spiritual realm over this present darkness. You see, the devil doesn't make us do everything, but what the devil will do, and through his kingdom, is to influence us, to try to get us to believe a lie, to try to get us to move in his liking. You see, we have the ability to resist or give in to the enemy. So this is what happens. Against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The Bible also says the God of this age has blinded their minds. The God of this age right now, Satan has a brief time. He knows his time is short. It says in the book of Revelation. And when you know your time is short, how many of you like uh, yellow jackets? I'm not talking about yellow I'm talking about those things that fly around. Have you noticed around the fall time, they start going crazy? I mean, you have a can of soda, which you shouldn't be drinking in the first place. But anyhow, if you're having something sweet or iced tea, they, they fly around. It's like, what? all summer long, they leave you alone. But right now, they're going crazy. Why is that? Because the yellow jackets know their time is short. And they sense their doom. They're going to die. And so they're more aggressive during this time of the season. And the enemy is more aggressive because he knows his time is short. When Christ died on the cross, it's, it's basically getting close to the final curtain call. is coming. And the enemy is doing all that he can. As the time grows near, he becomes more and more vicious. But the good news is, God is greater than the enemy. Okay? I wanted to help you understand that. So, what we fight against. These are the things you and I fight against. What do we fight against? It isn't just all the devil. The devil this, the devil that, the devil the other. No. We fight against the world. What is that? The world system of belief. The world view of the world, right? The Western view. And if we're not careful, if we don't recognize this, that the world has a tremendous influence upon us. If nothing else, I don't know if you remember back in the old days where people used to smoke in, in public places. I remember going to Friendly's and they had a no smoking section, which made no sense to me. I still smoke like smoke when I got out of there. A no smoking section is like having a no peeing zone in the, in the pool. It doesn't make sense. It's going to get on you, right? And so you come back and you smell like smoke. I remember going to concerts and coming back and I have a leather jacket. I have to put it outside. Well, listen, there is the secondhand smoke of the world that gets on you. And if you're not careful, you can become immune to it and not realize it and begin to have inhalation of secondhand sin. So that's why we got to be aware of the enemy. So we have the world that we're fighting against, okay? The world system. Another one we have is the flesh. Have you noticed, everybody? Yeah. Your body's like craving stuff, right? I want to sleep. I'm not going to go to church today. Or I want to eat this chocolate cake. Or I, I want to engage in this lust. I, I want to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and fight against that person. You have the flesh that is longing to control you. And then finally, you have this, the devil and demons, so all the, these are the three that we're often fighting against. It's a combination platter, okay? It's not just the devil. It's all these things and even more than that. So the Bible says in John 8, 44, Jesus talks about the character of the devil. Here he goes. He's talking to, by the way, the Pharisees of his day, the religious crowd that was trying to supersede Jesus because they were full of pride. They wanted to control the situation. They took the truth of God, and they didn't have the love of God. You see, the Bible without Jesus is dangerous. The, the Bible without the love of Jesus is dangerous. And that's what they did. They began to be accusers, and they began to lift themselves up. They wanted to be of the upper echelon. They were more interested in their position in being in charge than being in a position as a servant. So he, this is what he tells the Pharisees. You are the father, that you of our, well, excuse me, you are of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth. So anytime you see falsities and lies, that's the enemy, okay? From the beginning and he does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the 
truth. So Jesus is the truth. The opposite of truth is a lie. The enemy, what he tries to do is get you to believe a lie. If you'll swallow the lie and believe it, it gets into your conscious brain and then it seeps into your unconscious um, part of your brain and then you start acting out without even realizing it. That's why we need to renew our minds, okay? So because there's no truth in them, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is what? A liar and the father of lies. And that's the enemy. He's a destroyer. He is a diabolos, which means destroyer. So that's what he does. Okay, so about the enemy. There's a real enemy. There's real devil and invisible war. And the devil is a created being not equal to God but subject to him. And that's good news. There's not a yin and a yang that kind of go back and forth. No. God is a lot stronger than the enemy. The enemy is created by God. The enemy decided to rebel against God. They're not equal and opposite forces. There's no contest. Then why are we going through all this all right now? This is a brief time, a blink in the history. But l- let me just show you what the Bible says about it in Luke 22, 31. Look what Jesus says. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Now, what's happening? We knew what happened to Peter, right? He got himself into trouble. So before Satan could get to Peter, he had to ask God for permission. Let me read that again. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when you when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So what happens is the enemy can't touch you unless God lets him or we open the door. What does that all mean? Well, in the book of Job, I was just reading it this morning. Just read the first three chapters of Job this morning. Are you going through a year in the Bible, by the way, which ministers to me, which is a great encouragement and blessing to me every day. And I read through the Bible through a year. It's fantastic. But it talked about how um, the enemy could not touch Job unless God gave permission, which opens up a whole other thing. Well, why would God allow that? Well, we're not going to be able to conquer that today. Let me just say this. God is good. And the book of Job deals with that whole issue. But the truth is, nothing can touch you unless God allows it. And so we have an ability to pray and ask for protection. We can, and we can see that God often will change his mind based upon our prayers which is another topic for another time, okay? There's so, many, there's so much theology here. I could go off for a half an hour on one point, but we're going to move forward, okay? But he demanded permission. So understand that. And also in Revelation 20.10, look what it says here. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. God is eventually going to throw the enemy in eternal torment. So God is stronger than the enemy. You don't have to fear the enemy. Now, this is the problem. We we think the devil comes and scares us. That's probably the most counterintuitive and counterproductive thing he could do. Instead, you know know how sometimes you, I I always used to watch these movies. I don't watch them anymore, but I never could understand why in these horror pictures, someone's in a haunted house and the family stays. It's like, what the heck? Get out of there. I mean, I would be gone, right? They're hanging out in the house. What are they doing that for? Well, and what I find so interesting is this. We're afraid of the devil in that regard, but how come we're not afraid of the demonic forces of jealousy, lust, unforgiveness? Imagine we were to run away from that like we run away from fear of the boogeyman. Just saying, the enemy is a lot more crafty. He comes very secretly. He often is in the church, and he tries to get us. So we can see that, that he's stronger, God is stronger, okay? So there's a real devil, and we were fighting an invisible war. The devil is a created being, not equal to God, but subject to him. That's good news, everybody, okay? Also, we have power over the enemy through Jesus, okay? Not through ourselves, but through the name of Jesus. I'm not afraid of demons in Jesus' name. In fact, we prayed for people, and we've seen demons leave. That's for next week. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. I'm going to ask the ushers to bring out the snakes and scorpions. I'm going to walk on them right now. (laughs) Some churches do that. Insane. That is a metaphor 
uh, what talks about what the enemy is like. He's not saying to walk on scorpions and to handle snakes. Okay, everybody? Just want to make sure. So if you have any ideas to go to a pet store, please do not do that. So there's a real devil. We have visible war. We have power of the enemy. We can give the, uh, and also here's another one. We can give the enemy authority in our life by our actions and attitudes of heart. We give the enemy authority. The enemy tries to get us to open the door to let him in. How many of you have got these phone calls on your cell phone saying that your warranty is running out on your car? Right? My son, he didn't have a car, and they call him up. What the heck? Right? And, and, and so people get, they get snookered by this. And well, what's the deal with that? Well, what do, what do I do when I hear that? When I see a number and I don't recognize it, I hang up. If there is dead silence when someone calls you, it's a computer call. Hang up! My parents had this thing on their, on their phone. It's irritating. I call them. It says, please state who you are. And I had to go through all of this until they answered the phone. So I'm going to rush to talk to them. I'm like, please state. And you have to do voice commands. And you're driving a car, and the kids are talking. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. Can, I just, can I just kind of bellow for a few moments? All right. But we often give the enemy authority of our lives by our actions. And how do you mean by that? Well, you can see right in Ephesians. In your anger, do not sin. By the way, it's not, it's not sin to get angry. It's what you do with the anger. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not, what? Give the devil a what? A foothold. And sometimes a, a vacuum cleaner salesperson will come to your house and they'll put their foot in the door to get, to get in. Don't even allow it. It's like, just think of this. When you hear the enemy calling, it's like a, it's like a warranty in your car. Hang up. Don't even listen. Don't even talk. Don't even do it, right? So what do we have to do? Not give the devil a foothold. What are the major footholds we give? The enemy is not to forgive each other. That is the number one strategy of the enemy is to get us not to forgive each other and ourselves. Because once he gets us not to forgive, you know what that does? It gives the enemy keys to your house. I'm just telling you. Jesus says, you must forgive as I've forgiven you. If you don't forgive, the Father won't forgive you. Then he gives a parable and talks about a man that had a lot of money and chose not to forgive after God let him off the hook. And it says in the parable, hand him over to the torturers till he pays every last cent. When we don't forgive, what we're doing is we're throwing down the cross of Christ. We're saying, it's, that, it's not valid in my life. Ouch. And the enemy loves to use unforgiveness. That's his biggest trick. And some of you need to forgive each other. One of the things, my, my wife and I, Sandra, do not have a perfect marriage in any stretch of the imagination. But you know what we do? We forgive each other daily. And she has to forgive me probably 10 times a day, right? Seven times 70. She keeps saying that to me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But seriously, I, I, I'm telling you the truth. That's the secret of our marriage is we realize without God we're a wreck and we forgive each other. And what that does, that closes down the enemy. Another way is maybe to, uh, to get involved with all sorts of things. You give the devil a foothold by anger, by lust, by giving in to things which are not healthy. Because the enemy has to go to the Lord, has to go to God with a search warrant. You ever hear about the police? They go to someone's house, they need a search warrant in order to go into the house. They can't go in without a search warrant. Well, the enemy can't get involved with your life without permission. And we often give the enemy permission through our actions. And he uses the law of God to get into us. Now, listen, God's a God of grace, and we help each other with this. Don't have to be afraid in that regard. But... We're the ones that open and close the door. So when I start feeling jealousy, I need to act like it's Michael Myers chasing me. <laughs> you know who Michael Myers is? Okay, you guys are saved in this place. Okay, it, it, when I feel jealousy, anger, and all, it's like a, a, a knife, a, a, an axe murderer chasing me. That's how we should run from those things. I don't, I am not gonna, I am, I am gonna forgive. I'm not gonna let bitterness get in my heart. I'm not gonna have a complaining spirit because that opens the door to the enemy. It's like letting an ax murder in your house. That's what it does. And we, we don't take it seriously because it's like, well, it's only unforgiveness. No, it's, it's, it's powerful. The enemy does that all the time. Resist him, 
First bit. Resist him firm in your faith. Resist. And since the Bible tells us to resist, it wouldn't tell us to resist unless we could resist. You don't have to do what your old nature says. You are not a victim of your body. Our culture says, you can't help it, you are. No, listen, if I did everything I felt I was gonna do, I'd be in prison with five or six life sentences. I don't listen to everything my body or my mind tells me, right? Resist him firm in your faith in God, right? Knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brothers throughout the world. You're not the only one going through this. No temptation has overtaken you, but what's common to man. And God is faithful, not allowed you to be tempted more than you're able to. But with each temptation will provide an avenue of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 14. So these are, these are things you need to memorize, by the way. So how do we resist them, okay? So what are some strategies of the enemy uh, as we wrap up here today, okay? One of the things is this, making too much of him or ignoring him. We talked about that. C.S. Lewis says this, there are two equal and opposite era into which the race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy uh, interest in them, and it says he's pleased with both. And that comes from the book Screw Tape Letters, which I highly recommend. So, what are some strategies? Making too much of them, or this temptations, thinking too highly of yourself. That can be, you can think it's all about me. Another thing after that is accusations. The enemy uses two things he uses temptation and accusation. Accusations is thinking too lowly of yourself, of your Savior. Accusations is thinking too lowly of your Savior and yourself. In other words, God can't forgive me. I screwed up. Okay? Thinking too highly of yourself, and now over here, you're thinking too low of your Savior. So, see, it's so interesting. There are people out there, I can do whatever I want to do. I, 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 God will forgive me. And then there's other people out there that feel like they're condemned. Well, my past, I'm such a horrible person. I went through a divorce, or I did this, or I did the other thing. I, 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 I did horrible things, and God can't forgive me, and it's not, I'm, I'm any good for God. And you think that's, that's pious? It's not pious. It's arrogant. Because what you're saying is that Jesus is not enough for you. So there's accusations, and the enemy comes, and he accuses. He'll tempt you to do something. Then after you do it, he'll accuse you. It's a wonderful scenario he does. Okay, so that's what happens. So let's look at it. Strategies of the enemy. First one is temptation. What happens with that is this. You have ac temptation, accusation. Okay, the two basic strategies he uses. Minimize God's holiness and wrath. Hey, it's no big deal. Everyone's doing it, everybody. It's okay. God forgives. Go ahead and enjoy yourself. And then ask for forgiveness later on. You keep doing that, and you know what happens? You don't care about it anymore. And you can become callous and cold to the point you're going to ignore God. That scares me. When, when sin no longer bothers me, it bothers me. Because I'm like, uh-oh. When I, when I see world events and I don't care about them, God, I'm getting hardened towards the things that are going on. I don't want to be hard. I want to cry for Afghanistan. God, I want to care about the unborn. God, I want to care about racial injustice. God, I want to care about these things. I want my heart to be broken for his, right? And, and so... We often do that. We minimize God's holiness and wrath. Or the accusation is this. What we do is this. We minimize God's mercy and love. That he's not good enough to do it. You see, that the two, two, these are two, side, two ditches on the side of the road that, that we can fall into. There's another one. Overstate his mercy and love. Hey, it's okay. All you need is love. Da, 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 da. Hey, it's okay, man. Peace and love, bro. Or we can go this way. Okay, overstate his holiness and wrath. I'm doomed. I'm going to hell. I just sinned today on the way to church. I cut the person off at the light. God's going to send me to hell. And you're afraid you're going to go to hell. And if you're afraid you're going to go to hell, you'll start acting like hell. So the enemy uses both these situations. I like this tremendous book in the 1600s. It got a name by Thomas Brooks, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. I ordered the book this last week and I'm reading it. It's in Old English, by the way. But man, it's profound. Incredible that someone that lived that long ago, his writings still ring true today. You can look him up on uh, Apple Tunes or whatever, or Amazon. Don't do it right now. But this is some of the things he said. He actually has about 30 of these things. He has 30 things the enemy uses and the antidote to get rid of it. And I'm, I'm actually bringing it up to modern language because some of it's, it's old English. Okay, But this is what he says. This is the strategies of the enemy. 
He shows the bait and hides the hook. Happens all the time, right? Hey, enjoy yourself. Hey, listen. You only live once. The girl at the office, you know what? I have that love and feeling. Oh, that love and feeling. I'm at the coffee place getting some coffee in there. Let me just talk to her a little bit more. It's okay. As hey, long as I don't get involved. And, and you, next thing you know, you, fa you fall into that, and you think, well, it's okay. No one will know. And you swallow the hook, and then look what happens. It's okay to take a little bit from the company. No one's going to know, and you swallow the hook. The next thing you know, it's like heroin. You take it once or twice, and you're hooked. And this is what the enemy does. He shows the bait and hides the hook. Another one he says is rationalize sin as a virtue. Well, you know, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't get drunk. I, I just enjoy alcohol. Jesus' first miracle was wine. But so I know I get a little inebriated, but it's okay because God understands. Because after all, you know, it's okay. Hey, hey listen, I, I know. I, I, hey, listen. It's okay to look. Just don't touch. All right? doesn't make a difference where you get your appetite as long as you eat at home. These are things I've heard from people. And you rationalize the sin as a virtue. Hey, it's no big deal. Everyone's doing it. That's one of the things we can do. And here's another one. Notice the sins of those Notice the sins of those you admire. And that's like, that's the same old thing you hear growing up. Well, Johnny does it, that mommy. You know, Judy does it, mommy, right? You hear it all. And of course, what do we all say? We know it. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to talk about jumping off a bridge. Will you jump off a bridge, right? We always say, well, they're doing it too. And I, I even worked for a pastor who was getting involved with joking and, and jesting and all that. And I thought, well, gee, I need to loosen up. After all, he's a godly man. And so I started to loosen up my joking, which was inappropriate. Because the pastor did it, and I admired the pastor. And we do that all the time. Notice the sins of others you admire. How about this one? Overemphasizing God's mercy. We talked about that already. We don't want to go there again. Hey, it's all about mercy, man. His kindness leads to repentance, it says in Romans. Yeah, read three verses before that. It talks about judgment. We pick things out like that. Here's another one. Makes you bitter over suffering. It's like, you know what? Phew. I've suffered so. This will probably happen to Noah. After the flood, he's like, I'm getting drunk. <laughs> After that flood, I'm getting drunk. Or how about this? You know, I've gone through such a hard time. God understands if I just indulge a little bit right now. It's okay. I, you know what? I, I've, I've worked hard. I deserve this. I deserve this. And what we'll do is we'll give into a temptation. We'll give into maybe not reporting our income. Or maybe we'll go into stealing from the company. Maybe we'll, you know, maybe we'll go into getting involved with something you shouldn't be looking at. Well, after all, she's not meeting my needs, so it's okay for me to look up pornography. After all, I'm only human. It's okay that I do that. It's okay I talk to that person because my wife or my husband is not showing me the right amount of attention. So it's okay for me to have a relationship. There's nothing going on. I just enjoy the attention. All right? This is what we do. It makes you bitter because you're suffering. Well, because I'm suffering, I'm going to do this. Here's another one. This is, a, this is a funny one. He gets you to compare one area of your life to another. Do you want to understand that? Watch The Godfather. Where they're, <laughs> have you ever seen the last scene of The Godfather? Pastor, I can't believe you watched that film. Oh, I did. For, pray for me. But in the last theme, a less, in the last scene of the Godfather, you had the God, one of the uh, son there is sitting there, and they're they're dedicating a baby. They're basically baptizing a baby, and he's being a good, he's going to a good Godfather. Meanwhile, at the same time, he's whacking people with an order to kill a bunch of people at the same time. But because I go to church, because I treat my mom okay, it's okay for me to do this. Uh, and just because because I tithe and I give to the church and I, I help out the pastor, then I can do this on the side. Because after all, I got this to counterweight. It doesn't work that way, everybody. And that's one of the, tr the, the tricks the enemy does as well. So, what's the nuclear option? You heard of the nuclear option, right? That's when everything blows up and the world's over with. <laughs> okay? And when we drop a nuclear bomb. You want to drop a nuclear bomb on the enemy? You want to have great power in spiritual warfare? I do. First of all, the blood of Jesus Christ is the, is the greatest of all. Okay? There's no question. But out of that arsenal, there's another thing, another thing that you and I can do that breaks the back of the enemy. It destroys them. You know what it is? It's called humility. Humility. James 4, 6 through 7 says this, but he gives more grace. Therefore, God says, God resists the proud. Quoting Proverbs, Peter also gives the same verse. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. 
Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And 1 Peter says this, uh, a couple of verses before our passage today, clothe yourselves. Now, in order to clothe yourself this morning, I had to put this shirt on. I had to put it on. And sometimes you have to put it on before it becomes you. Sometimes you have to forgive somebody even if you don't feel it. Sometimes you're going to have to walk away from that temptation even though you'll want it. I'm going to put on, right? I'm going to put on humility towards one another. God opposes the proud. God does not like the proud. Do you know what happened in Isaiah? It talks about Satan. Satan, who was the son of the morning star, Lucifer. He said, I will make myself like the most high God. I will ascend to the highest mountain. And what happened was he liked the light of God. He was supposed to shine on God, but he liked the light himself. He says, I will be like God. And that was the first sin, pride. And guess what he did to Adam and Eve in the garden? You will be like who? You'll be like God if you do this. Pride, me, I'm the center of it all. This is this grace power. Now, how do you break it? The Bible says, as the worship team comes up, it says in Philippians chapter 2 about Jesus, had the same attitude that was of Christ Jesus. Although he was equal to God, he did not equate equality with God, something to be grasped, but he lowered himself. He stepped out of heaven. And the Bible says, and being found in an appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and give him the name which is above every name. Why? He humbled himself. Not my will, but your will be done. God, it's not about me. It's about you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to humble myself. It's the greatest source of strength. Humility is strength. That the, the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Why? Because what? To the process of death, he went to the cross. As a result of that, that in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, including the devil, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And how did that happen? He humbled himself. You want to kick the enemy down. You and I have to learn to humble ourselves before God. Be humble. Realize that God is God and you're not. Be humble in temptation, that it isn't, a, it isn't all about my freedom in Christ. Be humble in accusation and not listen to the lie that you're not good enough. But believe God above all. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lowering lion, seeking someone to devour. We're going to finish out reading here. Resist him. We talked about how to resist him today. Firm in your faith. Knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brothers, brotherhood around the world. Are you connected to other brotherhood? Are you connected to other believers? I'm telling you, please, don't fight. Don't live this life by yourself. Get around other believers. Get involved with small groups. Start a small group. It's coming up. You need to be connected. And after you've suffered a little while, we're going to suffer, guys. God of all grace. The God of all grace, who has called you to eternal glory in Christ. Amen? The best is yet to come, everybody. This is a blink compared to eternity. Has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. Will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Amen? To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen? By Silvanus, a faithful brother as a regard. And that was the scribe that was basically dictating what he was saying. I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Beyond your thoughts, beyond your feelings, beyond circumstances, stand on the Word of God. Let every man be a liar and God be true. She who is, in, he, she who is at Babylon, which represents Rome, who is likewise chosen, the church in that area, sends greetings. Notice, there's community. You see that, everybody? And so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. He shows a, a mutual love for each other. See, we're called to be with each other. 
peace to all of you who are in Christ. And so ends the book of 1 Peter. So I want to conclude with this basic premise. It's this. Your sins are so serious, it required the death of the Son of God, Jesus. Our sins matter. Our sins are toxic. God is perfect. You're not. You cannot coexist. Here's another one. You are so loved. He wanted and died for you. You are so loved and you are so wanted. He died for you. To receive it, you must accept the gift. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. How are you with God today, everybody? Have you given your life to Jesus? Remember, it's not being good enough. You can never be good enough. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Today is a day of salvation, so I know better how to pray. I'm going to ask you, maybe you used to walk with God and you're no longer walking. I do this every week because you don't know when your last day is. Or maybe you've never completely surrendered all to God. You always had a caveat. He's either all or he's nothing. If you'd like to give your life to Christ for the first time or renew your commitment, can I see a quick show of hands? Or someone online to go ahead and say, that's me. Be bold enough. Let's pray this prayer together in our hearts. Lord Jesus, go ahead. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. Today, I step down from being in charge of my life. I give my life to you. My life is yours. Come fill me now in Jesus' name. Thank you that I am now your child based upon what you did on the cross. My acceptance of that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you became born again. The Bible does not say, say a prayer and you're good to go. This is what the Bible says. Jesus says, come, follow me. Cornerstone Church is a community of people that are following Jesus together. We want to encourage you in your walk. And, and there's some next steps. I'm going to ask you to put that number up there, uh, if you could, on the screen, to give your life to Christ. You want to follow Jesus, you can text BELIEVE to 860-499-4888. That's text BELIEVE to 860-499-4888. We'll help you with the next steps. Also, since most, some of you are here, <laughs> a lot of you are here, you can pull the card out of your front pocket. It says, MY DECISION TODAY. Okay, everybody? Hey, listen, I want to just encourage you with one more thing before we do one more thing. <laughs> it's this. Stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ. God is greater than the enemy. You know under no obligation to sin. God is stronger than the enemy. We can resist him. Don't fall into temptation where you make excuses and don't fall into accusation. But stand in the great power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Hey, listen, one more thing we want to be able to do. This is an opportunity to give. You don't have to give. You get to give. And I've been old, and I, the, you know, what do you call it? David said this in the psalm. He says, I've been young, and now I'm old, and I've never seen the righteous begging for bread. I've been, old, I've been young, and now I'm middle-aged. Uh, God is always taking care of me and our family. He will take care of you when you trust him. When you tithe 10%, and you give offerings to him and say, God, it's yours anyhow. God will bless you. I'm telling you. He may not give you your greeds, but he will meet your needs. So these are the four ways you can give. One way is text Cornerstone Church to 833-245-5608. You can click at cornerstonechester.com. You can get our push pay app. You can mail it through the mail. Or, since many of you are here, there are boxes by the back doors as you walk out of here and the front doors if you want to drop your connection cards there for prayer. All right, everybody? Hey, listen, before we conclude, one more thing I want to say to you. We are having baptisms next week. If you've never been baptized, just come next week. Bring your bathing suit, uh, change your clothes, and we'll help you along the process. You should be baptized. We encourage you to do that. Also, next week, we begin 21 days of prayer. Listen, everybody, why not get ourselves calibrated together? We're going to have 21 days of prayer. 
starting next week. Okay, everybody, we're going to meet here at 6.30, Monday through Friday, 6.30 to 7.30 every day. We're going to have a broadcast online as well. We're going to pray together. We're going to go after God together. We're going to recalibrate our lives. Listen, we need God like never before. We want to be ready to face the fall as we get back to our normal pattern of living. At least hopefully it's normal. <laughs> All right, everybody, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you, may he shine his face upon you and give you peace. Walk in the strength and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. Hey, listen, if you need prayers, uh, you go ahead and we'll have the prayer team up. Otherwise, we dismiss you. Be careful out there and uh, we'll see you soon. God bless you.